Now moving on, it is indeed a great pleasure for me to introduce you to today one of the most distinguished scientists, Professor Emeritus Kaide Azim University, President National Council of TIP, Vice Chair of World Commission of Ethics in Science and Knowledge, and focal person of Alliance of International Science Organizations. He has also received UNESCO gold medal in recognizing his efforts in ethics in science and technology. And he is also a recipient of Tamgai Imtiaz and Satarai Imtiaz. I may humbly request Professor Dr. Zabta Khan Shanwari to take start of the presentation at the topic on the topic of drought tolerance to overcome toxicity and ensuring food safety of rice. Please welcome Dr. Zabta Khan Shanwari. Thank you very much for nice uh, introduction. I'm really grateful and I'm sorry I intruded. Uh, Sakib, uh, grateful to Sakib, Dr. Sakib Marif who accommodated me because I have committed somewhere. Can you see my screen now? Can you see my screen? Somebody can. Is it okay? It is visible. Okay, uh, if everything is okay, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. What I'm going to tell you. Thank you. Uh, what I'm going to tell you, I, I try to be very, very brief, though I prepared a lot of material for the students. I expect they are there. Uh, what I was going to talk to you was the uh, toxicity. What is that in the food, specifically in rice? And then can biotechnology if you work on a drought tolerance because toxicity, mainly major toxins are because of drought, because of stress, either abiotic or biotic stresses. So that is the two aspects that I'm going to talk to you. First of all, uh, toxicity. Toxi uh, I have some basic terms for you, for the student's sake. And that is, what is it? Specifically, when the humans are any living organism, when they are under stress, whether because of a disease, uh, you know, biotic stress or abiotic stress, they produce certain toxin and they, they, they face the toxicity. So, and there are many toxins, but I, I focus on plants and specifically on rice. Uh, so there are, for example, cyanide, alkaline, fungal endophytes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but one of the major one that, is, that uh, creates a lot of problems uh, that is aflatoxins. Uh, we can call it invisible poisonous sort of fungi uh, that are in the uh, maize, rice, sorghum, groundnuts, etc. Uh, uh, and that, that uh, contaminates the crop and when humans use it, they face a lot of problems. So that is that it remains there in the crop and when you consume either the fruit or the crop, you are under stress. Now, aflatoxins causes and risk. Uh, if you look at these countries I have shown on the right side, from China to all over, the rice crops mainly have this, this number of tons of rice has this aflatoxins. And that is because of a fungus, which is asparagus species, and that, uh, that contaminates and when human use it, human face a lot of problems. And those problems are sometimes very severe, from cancer to stunted growth to immune suppression. So a lot of problem that human, uh, uh, you know, faces is because of that food. And that is that you have somehow to, to cater that food and specifically the poor. You know, those subsidized food that you buy in the market are of substandard and they use a, a crop, either wheat or rice or maize, that are uh, really contaminated and the poor community suffers a lot. So that's why you have to be very, very careful. Now the limit of aflatoxin, how much is it dangerous? How much is it risky? For different countries, it is different. It ranges from one microgram per kilogram to 30 microgram per kilogram. In India, for example, and Brazil, 30 microgram, they, they consider the safe limit. But in some countries like Bosnia, like uh, Switzerland, they are more cautious and even one microgram, they consider it is contaminated 
and they are discouraged to use it. Another toxicity, we should discuss it when we talk about biotechnology. I'm going to talk to you today about genetic engineering and crop modification, GM crops. So that too, some people worry that they, that may also cause some kind of toxicological impact or allergenic impact. Or, so those we have to really, when we talk about biotechnology, we have to be careful. Now coming to the biotechnology with this background of toxicity, what should we do for drought tolerance and how we do? I personally did this work in Japan. And that was uh, when we talk about crop biotechnology in simple words, you work for either agronomic traits or quality traits or novel crop. So for agronomic, you have biotech, abiotic, and yield or more crop you need for the population and so forth and so on. And But when you do all this, you have to be really careful. These are some of the problems that universally people think about, like traceability, where that gene goes ultimately, uh, and how can we quality assure, et cetera, et cetera. And gene transfer and become making this as a weed. Uh, those are the issues that when we talk about toxin, we have to be careful uh, when we talk about gene and protein risk. On the other side, we talk about crop risk. So if we talk about the risk of genetically modified food, we have to understand these basic mechanisms so that the population and the common man knows uh, how is it. And for that, there is a system, earlier speaker talked about food safety. This is the system that as an organization of yours, which works mainly on food safety, should be telling the people, the community, and the stakeholders, policymakers, about the risk. What is the risk? How you assess the risk? How you manage that risk? And how you communicate that risk? I'm not going into details. These are various aspects. I'm sorry, because I have to be quick. I promise, Sakib, that I will be very, very quick to not to consume a lot of time. So these are the risks that you have. You need to understand your organization should understand these mechanisms and then they should coordinate with the people. Another issue that we should be talking in your conference is that we are evolving. The human science is evolving. Uh, we were having earlier first generation of, you know, uh, functional food, what we call it, vitamin supplements, uh, calcium enrichment, you talk about, you know, um, and fibers, etc. Then came second generation, last two decades, three decades, when they said, please consume the whole food like broccoli, yogurt, green tea, that kind of thing. Now is the third generation. Scientists believe that if we know these are the micro and macro nutrients needed for a human being, why don't we give them a capsule, a simple, uh, rather than doing a lot of, you know, many other things and all. So those are the issues that we need to understand in the current uh, work and then we should be understanding the food and biotechnology where these toxins are involved and how can biotechnology help to reduce this. Another aspect which I just touched in one second is the biggest risk that our world is facing this year or the years to come. And number one is extreme weather or climate change or drought in a real sense. Uh, specifically in Pakistan, if I show you a picture, this is the current year picture of your arid zone where uh, humans, animals uh, are dying because of either no water or contaminated water. And that is, and I give you one example that in this civilization, thousands of years ago had gone because of drought, because of climate. So we didn't learn a lesson. We were having a lot of contamination with the climate and that's we will be suffering uh, a lot. Now coming the solution to biotechnology very quickly. Uh, Africa is doing, producing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, iron toxicity tolerant species, uh, varieties, uh, uh, rice variety. I'm mainly focusing on rice, then coal tolerant, et cetera, et cetera. That will help. Uh, so for future, what we should be needing to do is uh, one, that our food should not be lost because the uh, what is the pre-harvest loss uh, or toxicity? What is the post-harvest toxicity? So we have to work in a system where we produce a food that is good for the human being and then yield that soil and then other things that we need to work together. So now we, do, we, we should understand what is happening. 
23% of the Earth's surface annual temperature is more than 40 degrees centigrade, including our part of the world also in summer, uh, it is really. But when you go close to the crops, near the leaf area, it is not 40, it is 50 degrees centigrade because of the, so that you understand and then you develop. What we did in, uh, in Japan, uh, specifically my specialty was, we produce promoters and genes that are responsive and that can tolerate drought, uh, that can, you know, uh, work on a, a rice specifically, uh, that are susceptible to drought, that can resist the, the uh, that crop. And uh, because rice can do 45%, you know, uh, of that, that you can then, if you have, you succeed, if you have less water, rice will have this toxic elements, uh, aflatoxin, etc. But if you produce such a genetically engineered crop, that will help to tolerate drought, to live, uh, live in a less water area, and that will help. So for drought rest, there are a variety of proteins and genes responsible. It's not one gene. It's a gene family that acts on uh, drought tolerance, and the uh, hypothesis that a group of genes that develops resistance for drought, there are a group of genes that work in under low stress. So we have to work on that, and that is what we did. We produce drought responsive element binding protein, and one of the, we call it RD29 gene. What we did was this was the pathway that now it works from drought to single perception of the cell going to AB independent and independent. I'm not going technical too much for the student. But finally, we will produce such a variety that tolerate uh, stress response and that in future will be having, you will not have, you know, those aflatoxin and all this. We did this in Arab Arabidopsis because 58% of the Arabidopsis genes are having orthologs in rice. So if you do an Arabidopsis, which is a modern plant, you can work in rice too. And then we were finally able to work. And secondly, we work on mutagenesis the every, I, I, you know, uh, uh, mutated every single nucleotide of the promoter region, 1.5 kilo base pair, and then produced this uh, three gene families that are in one bigger 8.7 kilo base pair segment. These three genes were mutated, each one of them. And finally, I was able to produce a nine base pair promoter region important element that can, if you transgene your crop, that will help you. This is how we did. We, we you know, are very quick. We did everything and finally when we did the gene assay, we were able to know how can and then we did experiment in the parts and you can see the green uh, that there was some, uh, you know, control that there was no water and then uh, with water and we were able that uh, we could trace it even where our gene works in root, in leaf, in uh, pollen, in, and, uh, in the seed. And uh, if you see this bluish area, this means that my gene is working there and is uh, helping the plant to tolerate drought. Then it was working all other, you know, there was a lot of reports for salt and drought tolerance in many species, including rice. And the whole mechanism were understood, reported in my infection journal as a scientist, and now our genes are being used in, in from the single uh, signal plus perception of a cell wall down to the drought tolerance. The whole mechanism was explained, and this in future. So a lot of citation of this single author, more than a thousand, and people are using it. Another work very quickly, the last one minute I will be saying, my lab is work, also working on extreme offense. We, we collect water, soil from extreme region, including seawater, and we isolate genes. Those genes will help when we put in a plant, they will tolerate salt, drought, etc. We did this, what we call it, metagenomics. Uh, we, we get those microorganisms from there that can be used for agriculture, industry, environment, etc. We have done a lot of fights with us now and then we are contributing. I'm thanks full to Saki Barif because of whom I'm here today. Uh, I promised him, I'm sorry that I've committed some errors. So with very quickly, I'm trying to finish in 10, 15 minutes just to, to have a taste for you. Thank you very much, Saki. And I'm sorry that I, I pushed you to give me a time because I'm, I'm 
I have to go to another assembly meeting. Thank you very much. And if anything, Sakir, you can ask me if you have any. Thank you very much, sir, for discussing such remarkable facts and figures. It's our profound pleasure that scientists like you having international repute have joined us today. Thank you very much, sir.